Russians fleeing their country to avoid President Putin's partial mobilization of military reservists to fight in Ukraine. When I refused to take the call-up papers, an official said, suit yourself, but you'll be sent to prison for 10 years. Back in Ukrainian hands, but still under Russian attack, we report from the city of Kupyansk. We start in Russia, where many of its citizens are trying to escape the military mobilization announced by Vladimir Putin yesterday by leaving the country. Tickets for direct flights between Russia and Serbia have sold out. President Putin's order to mobilize 300,000 Russian reservists to fight in Ukraine led to protests yesterday at which more than 1,000 people were reportedly arrested. Our Russia editor, Steve Rosenberg, reports now from Moscow. Called up by the Kremlin, they set off for Ukraine. Russian reservists, now part of Vladimir Putin's war. There were scenes like these across Russia. A sense of shock at the first mobilization here since World War II, and apprehension at what lies ahead. <laughs> Daddy, cries a child, <laughs> as another group departs. But there was anger, too, outside a recruitment office. The protester says World War II was a real war, but this one, it's just politics. <laughs> Protesting in Russia can be dangerous. Mikhail Suyetin was detained at an anti-mobilization protest in Moscow. He says that down at the station, police tried to give him call-up papers. When I refused to take the call-up papers, an official said, suit yourself, but you'll be sent to prison for 10 years. She said it was against the law to refuse the draft. The public's being told the motherland is in danger. The message from the Russian authorities to the Russian people is, we had to call up the reservists. The West is trying to destroy us. NATO is waging a war against us. This is a fight for Russia's future. But some Russians have now concluded that for them, there is no future here. At Russia's border with Georgia, the queue of cars was unusually long as some Russian men of fighting age tried to leave the country. I, uh, I heard some speeches. Victor has decided to leave Russia because of the call-up. Victor is not his real name. He's asked us to hide his identity. There is a choice. For example, you, you go and you kill innocent people or you go to jail. I decided I don't want to make this choice. I'd better to live my life uh, somehow, I don't know, from abroad. Up until now, many Russians have tried to block out what's happening in Ukraine and get on with their lives. The call-up of hundreds of thousands of reservists has changed that. Reality is starting to hit home. Steve Rosenberg, BBC News, Moscow. Well, that's the picture in Russia. Meanwhile, Russia's conduct in Ukraine has been strongly condemned at a special meeting of the UN Security Council. The American Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, said President Putin had shown contempt for international law and the world must not let him get away with it. Now, his comments came as the Ukrainian military continues to make gains in the east of the country. Our senior international correspondent, Orla Guren, reports now from the newly liberated city of Kupiansk. This is Kupiansk. Ukraine calls it liberated territory. During our visit with an army escort, it doesn't sound that way. Every few minutes, more shelling. And it's soon very clear that war isn't far away. Well, we've just had to run and take cover in the building. There's been what sounded like heavy incoming fire. It's pretty clear that the Russians are continuing to target Kupiansk, even though they've been pushed out. Dangerous. Understood, understood. They want us away from the 
A few minutes ago, we heard uh, that the Russian helicopters uh, doing some shelling, and uh, it was nearby us. So we need to go to save your life and going from the, this city. Is this happening a lot in Kupiansk, a lot of attacks? Yes, yes. Every day Kupiansk under uh, Russian, sh uh, Russian shellings and Russian artillery. Oh. Quickly, quickly. Now Ukrainian forces are back, looking for signs of life. They're few and far between. The Russians brought destruction here, but some don't have a bad word to say about their former occupiers. They treated people normally, Alexander tells me. There was no torture, nothing like that. For us, it was no different with them or without them. They were here, but it feels like they weren't. They came and then they left. He says most here stand with Ukraine. Either way, they're now caught in the middle. With shelling back and forth. I ask Lilia how she copes. I do nothing, she says. I stay home and pray that nothing hits the house. Ukraine's victory in this city is messy and incomplete. There are untold stories of suffering here. And some believe sooner or later the Russians will be back. Orligiran, BBC News, Kupiansk. Well, on Thursday, the former Russian president, Dmitry Medvedev, and now the deputy chairman of Russia's Security Council, that's an advisory body to the Kremlin, said that Moscow could use nuclear weapons to defend annexed Ukrainian land. Well, he said the Donbass republics and other territories will be accepted into Russia and added that Russia has announced that not only mobilization capabilities, but also any Russian weapons, including strategic nuclear weapons and weapons based on new principles, could be used for such protection. Well, Mr. Medvedev was, of course, talking about plans to hold what Russia is calling referendums in areas of Ukraine occupied by Russia. The US has been keeping a close watch on these developments. And a little earlier, the White House national security spokesman, John Kirby, spoke with my colleague, Laura Trevelyan. Tomorrow, the Kremlin will start those referenda in the Russian-occupied territories in Ukraine. By Wednesday of next week, do you expect that Russia will declare that those territories are part of Russia? I think that uh, that's where they want this to go. Uh, we believe that these will be sham referenda. They won't be legitimate. They certainly won't be free or fair. They're designed, they're, they're preordained uh, to allow Mr. Putin to say, look, this is Russian territory. And now Ukrainian attacks are on, Rus on the motherland, not on Ukrainian territory, which is, of course, not true. And as you heard uh, Jake Sullivan, our national security advisor, say yesterday, we're not going to recognize that. And so many other nations around the world aren't going to recognize that. This is nothing more uh, than a ploy by Vladimir Putin to try to gain through some legitimacy through politics and electoral issues, that which he cannot gain militarily. But it's not going to work. No one's going to recognize it. Uh, and what needs to happen is Mr. Putin needs to leave Ukraine. He needs to stop this war. But isn't the problem that President Putin could say in the middle of next week that Russia's territory has expanded and any Ukrainian attacks on what he now says is Russian territory could even be met with a nuclear response? He said he's not bluffing. Do you believe him? As I said, we do think that part of the reason he's going to conduct these referenda is so he can claim Russian ownership over territory that's clearly Ukrainian so that he can then use it to justify uh, further strike? further military operations against uh, the Ukrainian armed forces. Now, look, we've heard this, blunt, the, the, these, uh, this rhetoric about uh, nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction since almost the beginning of the war. So you don't believe him? We take these... We take these comments seriously. We have to take these threats seriously, and we do, and we have been for seven months. We've been monitoring as best we can his nuclear capabilities. I can tell you that we don't see any indication that we need to change our strategic deterrent posture at this point. But it's irresponsible for a modern nuclear power 
to be talking about the potential use of nuclear weapons in that way. Nobody gains from this. You heard the president say yesterday, a nuclear war should never be fought and it cannot be won. But it's freaking out countries in the region. The president of Kyrgyzstan told the General Assembly that there needs to be a dialogue between East and West because there's talk of using nuclear weapons not as a last resort. It is a dangerous uh, precedent for Mr. Putin to be uh, using this kind of rhetoric in the context of a war clearly that he is losing inside Ukraine. Um, we're going to continue, as I said, to, to monitor this as, as, best we, as best we can and make sure that we can do what we have to do to protect our national security interests and those of our allies and partners.